you can start. Very good evening or good afternoon to everyone based on your time zone. I hope you're all well and safe. I would like to welcome you to the fifth talk of the Coherence Lecture Series on behalf of Team D Coherence. Today, we have Professor Julia Yeomans to address us, who was so kind to accept our invitation. In this lecture series, we will be hearing from renowned physicists who are actively involved in research with the idea of introducing various areas of physics as well as the research methodologies used in these areas. I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Professor Julia Yeomans is a British theoretical physicist and a professor of physics at the University of Oxford. Her research interests include soft condensed matter and biological physics. She obtained her BA from Somerville College, Oxford and her DPhil from Wilson College, Oxford, during which time she worked with Professor Rob critical phenomena in spin model. She then was a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell University with Michael E. Fisher. She was a lecturer at the Department of Physics at the University of Southampton prior to joining the University of Oxford. She is the professor of physics at Rudolf Perth Center for Theoretical Physics. Her research work includes theoretical modeling of processes in complex fluids such as drops on hydrophobic surfaces, microchannels, liquid crystals, as well as bacteria. She was elected as the Fellow of the Royal Society in 2013. She was the guest of honor at the 115th Statistical Physics Conference, and she chaired the Gordon Conference on Complex Active and Adaptive Matter California 2019. She has given several lectures and is part of multiple advisory committees. She also gave the P.S. Narayanan Memorial Lecture at the Department of Physics at our college, the Indian Institute of Science in 2017. So today, Professor Julia Yeomans will be talking about nature's engine, active matter, post which she will be taking questions from the audience. I request the audience to use the Q&A box to ask any questions they have. The questions will be read out by the moderators and the moderators for today's session are Rishik, Samyadeep, Abhiksha, Suhas, Sanjeev, Saloni and I, Nikita. Without further ado, I would like to request Professor Julia to address the audience. Hello. 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 That one day I can come and explore your wonderful country properly. It would be great to have questions because um, it's very strange talking to essentially a wall and sort of hoping there's somebody out there. And what I'm going to tell you about is active matter. Active matter is something uh, is, is a field of physics which has become very important uh, lately. People are getting very excited about it. So first of all, I'll tell you what it is, and then I'll try and explain to you the reasons why I think it's an exciting place to do research. So this is what we're going to do. Let's start by thinking about what active matter is. Well, active
So it's really something which transduces chemical energy into mechanical energy. And that's really just a fancy way to talk about living systems, to talk about biological systems. Because we and all sorts of animals just take chemical energy in the form of food and then use it to, to live and to move around. But if you're a theoretical physicist, real people and big animals are, are just far too complicated. And so what we tend to do is look at active matter on small length scales so that things are, are, are much easier to understand what's going on. And there's a whole range of this stuff, all the way from molecular motors, which we'll be talking about, which are the engines of the cell, all the way through to cells themselves, and then things like these tiny little micro swimmers down here, um, which let me just see if I can work out how to use this pointer. Um, and there's a pointer. Good. These little micro swimmers, these, these sperm cells moving around. So let's think about molecular motors first. Um, how do you move? If you ever asked the question, how do you move? And, and, and the answer is, of course, that um, we move because of muscles. Yeah, but what makes the muscles move? And in the end, you have to stop worrying about the engines inside cells because it's how cells move around and how things are moved around inside cells that eventually is going to end up leading to our motility and leading to us being able to be alive. So let's think inside the cell. The cell's sort of full of proteins and, 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 and other molecules. And it, what happens is that the proteins have to be moved from place to place in order to facilitate life processes. And the length scales are tiny. Cells are about 10 microns across normally. Uh, and these proteins that have to be moved are tens, 20 nanometers across. And the cell is full of molecules all moving around. It's very crowded in there. And you're at length scales where Brownian motion is important, where the molecules buffet each other around. And so how can you get the proteins to where you want them to be? Diffusion doesn't work, it's too slow. Swimming won't work because anything that small trying to swim in a straight line is just going to be buffeted around by these thermal fluctuations and it's never going to get anywhere. So what the cell does is, first of all, it lays down tracks so that these uh, little motors know where they're going. These tracks are microtubules and the cell's able to put them down and make them disintegrate again. And then this little thing here, these pair of feet, although everyone calls them heads, moving along is what's called a molecular motor. This is the kinesin molecular motor. So the way the cell gets proteins from place to place is that it puts them inside this big backpack thing here, a vacuole. It attaches the vacuole to a molecular motor using a tether. And then this molecular motor is able to move along the microtubule. We sort of know how it does it. Um, what happens is that the back foot uh, gains a molecule of ATP that allows it to detach from the, um, from the microtubule. And then really because of the shape of the protein, it behaves like a little catapult, that foot tends to get pushed forwards and then it grabs hold of the microtubule in front as it grabs hold, it releases um, a molecule of ATP and that allows the back foot to, 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 to then gain a molecule of ADP and everything can start again. This is an artist's impression of what's going on. It's a, it's a very nice simulation from Inner Life of the Cell, which is a lovely movie on YouTube. And it's pretty accurate, except everything slightly more stochastic than this, slightly more random. The thing doesn't just really just plod along. What it does 
is that it sort of moves forward and backwards, but on average it goes more forwards. So there's a really big question here, which is what about the control theory behind all this? How does the cell decide which molecules to put where? How does it decide to pack proteins, which proteins to put in the backpack? Often you'll get whole lines of these motors grabbing hold. You can see some of them here and they all move in the same direction. How does it tell the motors where to go? And if the microtubules overlap with each other, what happens if you get a traffic jam? And that really is not well understood at all. And it's a fantastic problem in control theory. Thought I should just show you a picture of reality rather than just a, a movie. This is a picture of those two heads using a light microscope. And this is time going downwards. And what you can see is the two heads flip forwards and the thing slowly moves along the microtubule. Here's another motor, another motor which drives cells. This one's a bit different. This one is the bacterial flagella motor and it sits here across the membrane of these little micro swimmers. These things are E. coli and they swim around by twirling their tail around. And this is the motor which propels them by driving the tail. It sits across the cell membrane. So here's a picture of the motor. This is the cell membrane, and here's the tail sticking out into space there. And again, this is an artist's impression because we don't really know exactly what's going on, but it's probably close. Each of these little um, objects is a different protein, and you can see that they have to be put together in a complicated way in order to create the motor. The motor goes round and round pulling this flagellum and it's driven by a proton current which moves across the membrane. So there's some pretty neat engineering going on here. The cell has to work out how to take all these proteins and put them together and put them together in the right order. If we tried to make anything that size, apart from the difficulty of actually putting such tiny things together, friction would kill you straight away and it just wouldn't work. This is a soft machine. The cell can put it together in um, the right order, we assume. And then presumably if something goes wrong and one of these proteins falls apart, then it's able to mend this machine. Again, this is a guess. It's just a movie with a guess of how this thing might be formed. So it's very clever. And if we knew how to do it, how to make these engines, what we'd be able to do is make they might be tiny, but an awful lot of these engines and they're very efficient and it might be a new way to make a whole new sort of machine. I'm going to show you now how far we've got, which is not very far. These are very clever experiments, but you'll see they're way off being as clever as nature. This is using active swimmers tiny little uh, micro swimmers to push round paddle wheels. So these dots in the back of the movie are just tiny swimmers about a micron in size. And then this thing is a paddle wheel about um, 60 microns across. And it's OK, it's not perpetual motion. And the reason is that you need to feed the things that are swimming and then they translate this energy this chemical energy into mechanical energy. That's the sort of machine. This is an example of uh, self-assembly and fabricated man-made active matter. These things are tiny colloids. 
colloids are just little balls, really, which are a micron across. And the experimentalist, David Pines Group in New York, has stuck this hematite onto the colloid. And when you shine light on the hematite, what happens is that it becomes self-propelled like a tiny rocket. It basically creates bubbles which push it along. And you can see that that causes these things to form rafts. And uh, say it again, uh, basically because they, they have this directed motion, they're self-propelled and they, they bump into each other and then they stick together. And if you turn the light off, so the colloids um, stop being self-propelled, then what's going to happen is that you just get normal Brownian motion and the rafts of particles are just going to break up and break apart. So, you know, we can do self-assembly, we can do motors, but they're not as good as the biological ones. And, and no disrespect for the experimentalists there, they're already very hard and clever experiments to do this. So that's the first reason why I think active matter is interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's related to biological machines. If we understood the biological machines, then we'd be able to make better machines of our own. The second one is, is perhaps more relevant to um, theoretical physicists. Now, I'm sure those of you that are at least a second year undergraduate in physics understand that, um, understand equilibrium statistical physics. You know about the Boltzmann equation and you know about the distribution of speeds of molecules in a gas. And people have understood this since the end of the 19th century. And, you know, it, it, we understand what happens when you put together a lot of particles which are in thermodynamic equilibrium. But active matter is out of equilibrium. Living systems are out of equilibrium. They're continually doing work and you have to be out of equilibrium to do work because if you're alive and you come to equilibrium, this is, this is really bad. And so these biological systems are an example of things out of equilibrium. And if you put a lot of them together, it's an example of non-equilibrium statistical physics. And that's something we really don't understand. We don't know how to write down theories of lots of particles when they're out of thermodynamic equilibrium. So now we can do the experiment. We can take lots of microswimmers, say. This is lots of E. coli. They're in a sort of two-dimensional fluid film. And let's see what happens when you just let them swim around. So lots and lots of active particles put together. And you get this sort of swirling motion, this sort of swirly motion, which looks like turbulence. And Many of you will know, never mind if you don't, but you know, turbulence is not meant to happen at these tiny length scales. Turbulence is something you see in waterfalls at large length scales, but these are very small length scales where usually flows are very, very calm. So we're seeing another sort of sort of turbulence. So let's see if there are other systems where you can see the same thing. If you're a theoretical physicist, you really like it when you can use one theory to describe everything because it's easier and because you don't have to remember so much. So let's go back to the molecular motors. And the reason I want to go back to it is that I just want to remind you about these microtubules, these long, um, long polymer like molecules and these kinesin motors. Because the next experimental system to look at this dense non-equilibrium active matter is a mixture of the microtubules and molecular motors. The molecular motors are special because they've got two heads. So 
both ends grab onto a microtubule and they form bridges between the microtubules. Now the motors are directional. They walk in one particular direction with respect to the microtubules. So if these guys are moving upwards, it pushes the microtubule down. And if these guys are moving downwards, it pushes the microtubule up. So if you get loads of these microtubules and get loads of the motors and put them in a test tube and add PEG, which just pushes them together, you end up with a system which is continually forcing itself, which is continually pushing the microtubules relative to each other. And let's look what it looks like. We'll work in a minute. There we go. These sort of um, white things are these bundles of microtubules being pushed around. And again, we can see turbulence. You can see an active turbulence in this system. But it's not quite random. You can see sort of patterns. Here's a threefold pattern. OK, and we'll come back and try and explain later on why there's this threefold pattern there. OK, now the, the next ones are other examples, um, really because I like the movies. And this is now active turbulence, or at least collective motion. This isn't very turbulent. This is collective motion where you have, again, a large number of active particles but now the active particles are fish. And they're behaving in a very strange way when this um, big animal tries to eat them. Now, I thought this was a shark, but someone pointed out that the um, people on surfboards weren't going to behave like this if it was a shark. And then when I was talking in front of a Dutch audience, it was pointed out that actually this isn't a shark, it's probably a seal. And somehow there's kind of an amazing thing that's I mean, there's some sort of collective behavior in these fish. And I, as far as I know, and I certainly can't, nobody knows how to predict that. Nobody understands why you get those patterns. And indeed, these patterns, again, large number of active systems, birds in this case. Of course, this isn't just physics, it might be the birds deciding to do things as well. But why does one get these patterns? And there's been a lot of work by theoretical physicists, many of whom spent long nights on rooftops in Rome trying to get data on these things. Actually trying to image them is really difficult because, well, I mean, imagine trying to follow in three dimensions all those different birds. Um, but again, we don't really understand why you end up with those patterns. I think going back now to tiny things, I have one more example. But first, let me say, right, that's this is this is now to summarize the, the, the second reason why I think active matter is exciting is that we're doing non-equilibrium statistical physics here and we don't know how to write down a full theory of that. The third reason is biology. Biological systems do things which look a bit like active matter. So this is active turbulence again, but now in a uh, in epithelial cells, eukaryotic cells, the ones which line the inside of your lungs or your stomach, if you take them out, presumably not from a human, but if you get these cells and you put them on a Petri dish and you just leave them there, they don't just sit there, they move. Again, you get this turbulent like state and also you get the cells suddenly start and take off and start moving in a given direction. They're starting to move around in a circle. And it would be nice to understand why and to ask whether physics can explain this. 
biology does some absolutely amazing things which um, might be explainable by physics. This is the fruit fly embryo and this is what happens as it evolves and each of those spots is an individual cell. So this is the fruit fly growing up, morphogenesis of a fruit fly embryo. And there's some physics going on there. You're seeing flows and you're seeing patterns form. And a very exciting question and a very interesting question is how does this work? At the moment we don't know. And how much is it physics and how much is it biochemical signaling which is enabling this animal to, to grow? Same organism, but something which I think we do have a fighting chance of explaining soon is this Drosophila egg chamber. I learned about these experiments just a couple of months ago, or just before lockdown, I guess it's more than two months now. This is the egg chamber of the fruit fly. And the eggs grow in the middle, and as the eggs grow, this thing expands and it becomes ellipsoidal in shape. And inside it is a layer of cells which line the egg chamber. And those cells rotate. I think we can see that here. If I can get this movie to move, you'll see that the cells are rotating around. There they go, they've got them labelled. And so it doesn't look a million miles away from the cells we saw in a petri dish suddenly rotating around. No one's sure why they do this. Maybe it's to try and encourage the egg chamber to grow and form its ellipsoidal shape. The Sally did some amazing experiments. She, um, she, she added blebistatin to this thing. Blebistatin is really a sleeping pill for cells. And so it sent the cells to sleep and they just stopped rotating. She then washed out the blebistatin and the cells started rotating again, but in the opposite direction. And then she repeated the experiment. And the next time they went back to the original direction. And each time she did this, the cells started moving in one direction and the other and then the other. They always change direction. That is mechanics, probably, and not cell signaling. And it'd be lovely to understand what's what's going on there. OK, so that really is the introduction. Why study active matter? And those are my three reasons for doing this. I'm now going to talk a little bit more about what I know more about, which is really the theoretical physics part of this, and talk a little bit more about the active turbulence. Before I do that, um, can I just see if anybody's got any questions? Yeah, ma'am, there's a few questions lined up for you. Right. Good, yeah, good. Uh, so the uh, a question asks all these uh, molecular motors uh, involve organizing lots of different molecules in a specific arrangement. So this decreases entropy and it shouldn't be very feasible physically. Yet they are highly abundant. So the same follows for all cellular organization. So if organization leads to a decrease in entropy, why do we find these organized structures so abundantly in nature? That's really put it pinpointing what active means. You're quite right that systems tend to increase their entropy and so you actually have to do work to end up with anything that's organized. And that's why the active systems need to use chemical energy to organize themselves. OK. 
another question which is been asked by Nilay. He asks, can active turbulence be related to the flocking which is observed in microorganisms? Both seem to be forms of emergent behavior. Yep. It absolutely can be um, related. Well, if you write down these models, many of them have flocking in one region of their phase space and active turbulence in another region of the phase space. So they're both non-equilibrium states. What you need for flocking is that um, these systems are what's called polar. They all want to move in the same direction and there's some sort of interaction which tends to align them with each other. And flocking's now been seen in these uh, eukaryotic cells. OK. Yeah, uh, the next question uh, has been asked and it's a very simple question. The question asks, what would be the advantage or what are the possible advantages of making small machines over bigger ones? That is a good question. The, the thought is that probably these are more efficient than bigger machines. They also have the big advantage of being biodegradable. And certainly you can use bacteria to do, well, I, I'm certainly not an expert on this, but bacteria themselves are used to do things like um, like environment, I think if you, you, they can be help. Environmental remediation, that's the word I want, environmental re remediation. You can add bacteria and that gets rid of harmful chemicals. So you could imagine if you can control this much better, then you might be able to do a better job of, of, of this, these machines. But I, I, I think probably that, that they're more efficient. But we're really a long way away from answering your question. Um, so I guess the real answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, the next question uh, goes as following. It asks, how are cells able to harness the energy produced by protons moving across membrane? By using these molecular motors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, by the design of the motors and exactly how they do it um, is that they are able to pump. I think the story is that they're able to pump ions across their membrane and that sets up a voltage difference across the membrane, which can then be used to power the motors. I see. Uh, the next question is, do the atoms in the molecules forming cells, are those atoms influenced by the magnetic field of the Earth? And if they are, how does it influence the motion of said bio biomolecules? Oh, that, that's a very good and very subtle question. I mean, the basic answer is probably no normally. Mm -hmm. But my husband works on this. He works on magnetic receptors in birds. And it's, I think, pretty well known that birds um, do respond to the magnetic field. And in particular, when they migrate, they use the magnetic field as a signal to go from one place to the other, so they know where they're going. Turtles, too, which apparently swim across the Atlantic and follow the magnetic field. So a lot of animals seem to have some sort of magnetic sense. So somehow something in those animals is responding to the magnetic field. And no one's quite sure what it is. And it's sort of exciting because um, it might be a, a quantum reaction, a, a reaction which depends on quantum mechanics um, in the beak of the bird, which is actually doing this. But it's very much a subject for research. And at the moment, that's just a hypothesis and it hasn't been pr proven. Um, there's also some very nice, some recent results which say that cells grow faster if you put them in a magnetic or electric field. But again, this is all very new, and if it's true, nobody knows why. Thank you. 
the next question goes, uh, do we have any idea why the egg chamber rotation alternates upon every application of the sleeping pill for cells drug? Well, you can have my version, all right, but this is totally a hypothesis, which is that outside the cell, you have the extracellular matrix, which you can think of as being a bit elastic, like a big elastic band. It's, it's a load of linked polymers. And maybe when the thing goes round, it sort of um, pulls this elastic band so it has some sort of tension in it. And then when you send the cell to sleep, that tension stays. When you wake it up again, it's a bit like a catapult and it pushes it back in the other direction. And we've got this to work in a simulation. But again, it's very new. This is all unpublished work and we're still trying to think about it. Right, shall I get on and then we can pause again later? Yes, we, can, we can keep moving forward. Right. Um, I just have to try and. Where's it gone? Play from current side, that's it. OK, so I want to explain about this active turbulence. And to do that, there's some background that I have to talk about first. I'm going to talk about liquid crystals and the idea of topological defects. And I'm going to talk about swimming at low Reynolds number. So there's a sort of self-contained bits, which are background you need to understand to understand about this active turbulence. So liquid crystals are compounds which are made up with molecules of this shape. And this is called an omatic. It's basically long and thin, so it has a preferred axis, and um, but the top and the bottom are the same. So it's not like an arrow, top and bottom the same, but you still have a preferred direction. And if you put together loads of molecules like that, or possibly colloids, they tend to line up all pointing in the same direction. And we've heard about entropy in the questions, and this is really to reduce um, to, 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 so that they have more space, so that they, they, they line up like this because then they can move around more and that increases their entropy. And this is called a pneumatic phase. And this thing, the direction is called a director in case I say it by mistake later. So we, we've got loads of these pneumatic phases at Oxford. Um, in the summer where everything's hot, our pneumatics are pretty random. But in the winter, when things cool down, um, you get into a proper, nice, lined up pneumatic phase. These long thin things could be swimmers, they could be uh, molecules, or they could be colloids or punts. And what we're going to care about these things is that they have topological defects in them. These are places where the pneumatic order, here it's nice pneumatic order, but they're places where the pneumatic order goes wrong, a bit like knots, if you like. And they're called topological defects because they muck up the ordering all the way out to infinity. And so if they appear on their own, they have an infinite energy. So they're not allowed to appear on their own, but they are allowed to appear in pairs. And in particular, you tend to get a pair like this. This is called a plus a half defect with one like that, which is called a minus a half defect. So we're going to come across these a lot. So if you could remember the, the, the sort of shape of them. OK, this one's like a comet and this one's got threefold symmetry. You actually get these topological defects all over the place. I think I put some in the picture here. Um, but up till now, we didn't see them in biology. And so what's we're now starting to see these things in biological systems. OK, so that was background number one. Background number two is um, some hydrodynamics and the idea of Reynolds numbers. So this is enough just, just so that, you know, we're physicists, we like equations. This is my favorite equation. This is the Navier-Stokes equation. Never mind if you're not used to it. It describes how fluids move. And 
A very important parameter is a thing called the Reynolds number, and that really tells me which of the terms of the equation is important. And if I'm at large length scales, this one is, and you get normal turbulence. If I'm at small length scales, this one is, and you get viscous flow. So at large length scales, Navier-Stokes says that you get this turbulent-like behavior where everything's moving quickly and you get lots of splashes and lots of mixing and you get lots of vortices. Um, must say when I saw this, I wasn't keen on going on, on, a, on a plane again. Usually what, what we expect is that at small length scales, everything's very calm. This is Volvox, which is about a 10 microns across and it moves happily around just spinning. And you can see the flows because of the sort of dust particles here, which are very smooth and calm. Low Reynolds number is special. And the reason it's special is, ah, oh, am I going to be able to do this? Sorry, I have to do this schematic. Let's try that. Yeah, that's it. The reason it's special is, is shown by this red. movie. Corn syrup dyed red. Oh, sorry. Just trying to turn off the sound, which is that one. Okay, and until I saw this movie, I didn't really understand flow at low Reynolds number. What's happening here? is that this is um, a beaker full of glycerine and very carefully dye is being put into this glycerine. Those of you that have actually been listening really carefully will say, OK, but she said that low Reynolds number was very small length scales whereas this certainly isn't very small. But that's OK, because the glycerin has high viscosity and you can cheat and high viscosity acts the same as tiny length scales. So the dye has been bunged in there and then uh, you get your graduate students to hold on to it and start stirring it up. And I'm going to try and probably fail to speed this up a bit. OK, but it's going round and round and stirring up the dye. And believe me, it's been stirred up seven times. So now it's just going, he's going back in the other direction. And well, just stirring it up more, presumably. So let's see what happens. You can count up to seven. We're we'll back where we started. OK, and if I could hear you, I hope you're going wow by now. Flow at zero Reynolds number is reversible. If you do something and then do it back in the other direction, you get back to where you started. And that has two consequences. The first consequence is that if you're a tiny swimmer who's swimming at low Reynolds number because you're so small, what happens is that if you had a swimming stroke which did something and then did it backwards in the same way, a swimming stroke which was reversible in time, you wouldn't go anywhere. You'd move forward and then you'd move backwards the same amount. And so that's why these tiny micro swimmers have tails which are like waves or which are like uh, which go round and round like corkscrews. So waves go along the tail or they turn like corkscrews because that gives them a direction in time. So these rather strange shape of bacteria are just because they have to survive in this low Reynolds number environment. The second thing, which is much less well known, is um, the shape 
of the flows set up by these tiny swimmers. If you measure the flow field a long way away from the swimmers, the way the fluid flows, it gets pushed out by the swimmers, front and back, and pulled in along the sides. This is the result of an a very clever, well, a very good graduate student, because this is an average over about a thousand of these things. It was it was hard work. OK, so but, but this flow field has a special symmetry. And it's this pneumatic symmetry. It has a special direction, but front and back are the same. Locally, they won't be the same, so the thing can move, but a long way away, front and back are the same. Swimmers have a flow field which has pneumatic symmetry. And that's why you get active turbulence. Let's just have a look a bit more about why. This is, this is maybe the hard bit, right? So this is what we're trying to explain. This turbulence, this low Reynolds number turbulence. Let's, I, mean, I can write down the equations which describe this. They're a sort of souped up version of Navier-Stokes. The Navier Stokes, but you have to add in the effect of the flow field due to the swimmers. You have to add in the pneumatic flow field. And what you get when you do the simulations is a flow field which looks like this. These yellow bits are basically jets of high velocity. And you get loads of vorticity, loads of swirling flows. If I plot the vorticity field, what you find is that you get these anti-clockwise bits, which I've shown in red, and the clockwise bits, which I've shown in blue. So active turbulence is a very strongly vortical state with lots and lots of swirls going on. The reason is that the pneumatic ordering turns out to be unstable if you have an active pneumatic. It's unstable to the flow fields produced by the swimmers. Because if you have a load of active particles, a load of little swimmers, if you like, lined up in a nice pneumatic state, and there's a tiny fluctuation, you can work out the flow fields that result in the tiny fluctuation, and they look like this. And so they're going to make the fluctuation bigger and bigger. And so my nice pneumatic can't survive. And what you get instead is this active turbulence. If I'm talking about pneumatic, oh, hang on, got this, got about this, just a picture of how it works. You can see here that you've got the swimmers locally, they're nice and lined up. But, but further away, you get bends in the pneumatic order, and that's making these flows, which is making the bends even bigger. So let's think about these topological defects. I've said that these things have pneumatic symmetry, that they're like pneumatics. OK, and I said that pneumatics have these topological defects, and they're in an ordinary pneumatic, they, they, they turn up in pairs and they tend to annihilate each other because energetically it's much better not to have them there. Let's see what happens in an active system. The red ones are my plus a half defects and the blue ones are the minus a half defects and there they are destroying each other in pairs. But by the time you get to the end, you get the same number. So that's not all that's happening. And if we look very carefully, what we see is not only do they annihilate in pairs, but I think there's going to be one up here. They create in pairs. You get these topological defects created. There they go. So really, these active systems, you can think of them as a gas of topological defects. You can get topological defects because you're pumping in energy. That gives the system enough energy to produce these defects. 
And the defects move around, these plus a halves move around. They themselves create a flow field, really because of the symmetry. They behave like little engines which move around. These guys create flows, but they don't move because the flows they create are symmetric. I think I've got the picture here. Here's the flow around a plus a half defect. You get these two vortices and the things moving in this direction. Here's the flow around a minus a half defect. You get these six vortices and we're going to see that in a real system later on. So if you remember the six fold symmetry. So I showed you experiments of this active turbulence this microtubule motor system. And so I've now said we get topological defects here. So, so do we, can we see them? But yes, we can, right? Here's one of the topological defects that has this threefold symmetry, a minus a half defect. And here's one that has a plus a half, it's like a comet that has a plus a half symmetry. And we look here, this is time snapshots of this system. Here's the plus a half defect being formed, leaving a minus a half behind. The plus a half moves because it's self propelled and the minus a half just sits there. So Active pneumatics, active systems have topological defects and that's what's driving these flows. So, you know, that's fun. We like doing that. We like solving equations. We like mucking around with the computer and getting pretty pictures out. But it'd be really nice if we could see these defects in biology biological systems. So my last story is the story of the hare and the tortoise. Now, hare and tortoise is very famous in the UK and I've talked to several people about it and people from different countries seem to, to, to be there. So, so do you have the hare and the tortoise story in India? Yep, it's pretty popular. Good, so we all know about the hare and the tortoise, right? Good. I thought it might be something like the elephant and the, I don't know, anaconda in India, but we're going to do heron tortoise here. So there we are. And, and this is uh, quite recent research, which is going to be published pretty much uh, the next couple of weeks, I think. And these are the people who did all the hard work. In particular, Armin and Ollie were the, uh, the students, postdocs, who, who really did the hands-on stuff. So this is the story of a slightly different sort of bacterium, one which crawls, Pseudomonas. It doesn't swim, it crawls on a surface and it crawls using these little sort of feelers called pili. And you can see here, I mean, this, this movie is, is these things crawling around. And again, you can sort of see this nomadic idea, they're long and thin. And at least locally, they sort of tend to line up with each other. Not everywhere, but just locally, they end up a bit like one of these pneumatics. And what our, bio our zoologist colleagues wanted to ask was, if I mix two of these things, two of these sorts of pseudomonases, which move with different speeds, so two populations with different speeds, what happens? which are best at spreading out. And so the way they um, got two populations is they looked at the wild type. And apparently the wild type is basically what they mean by that is the stuff that comes out of ponds. And then they genetically modified it to have this thing here, which is um, which has which has more of these feelers and therefore can move faster and it can move about twice as fast. So we can have a race between these things. OK, the wild type up here, which just has the normal number of feelers and the delta fill H down here, which has extra feelers. 
And so this one is spreading. There's a whole reservoir of them off the side of the screen. This one is spreading. And they're not dividing much. They're more like spreading just by spreading out because they're moving. And of course, this one's going to be slower and that one's going to be faster. OK, let's see that again, right? The top one is the one uh, with. Um, maybe I have to go backwards. Forwards. OK, top one is the slow ones. Parent tortoise story, the slow ones win in the end. So now let's look at a mixture and look at the edge of the colony. The blue ones are the slow ones. The yellow ones are the fast ones. This is the edge of the colony as a function of time. So the yellow ones win to start with, the fast ones dominate the edge of the colony, but as time goes by and the colony gets denser, the blue ones, the slow ones start dominating. So what on earth is going on? Well, I wouldn't, I've gone on about topological defects if this isn't a story of topological defects. Let's look for them in the colony. The red ones are the plus a halves and they're moving with their little arrows. And this is the threefold minus a half. You can certainly identify these in the colony. They're exactly the same as the ones we saw here. Okay, and I've actually written down the equations there if anybody's into equations. We're just solving those equations, but, but actually you can you can do a simpler model of this, right? You could you could do a simpler model because. What these things look like, what the bacteria look like is just rods moving around and not overlapping with each other. So this is really just a very simple computational model of rods which have a force on them to represent the fact they're self propelled and then which can't overlap with each other. And again, you can identify these defects, plus a half and minus a half defects. So then you say, you know, but OK, they're defects, right? Are the defects in the rods like the defects in the um, differential equation model or like the defects in the real system? So we measured the flow field, this velocity field thing, just to check. This is what I showed you before velocity field around plus a half with these two loops, velocity field around minus a half with the six loops. This is what happens in that rod model. Two loops in the plus a half, six loops in the minus a half. A lot more noise because it's much more noisy in these simulations. And this is what happens in the experiments. Here's the two loops in the plus a half. Here's the one, two, three, four, five, six loops in the minus a half. So at least to this level of accuracy, I know this is pretty noisy. We're seeing the same thing here. So what on earth is going on? Well, I'll tell you the answer and then you can see if you believe it. If you look at these bacteria sort of with a microscope from above, what you see is clumps form. They're the clumps forming. And this is starting again with different sorts of imaging. You can see very obvious clumps. These are clumps of the faster bacteria and they're clumps where the faster bacteria have moved to point away from the surface and then got stuck. So Ollie did this um, picture just yesterday. OK, so you get locally, you get places where instead of moving horizontally on the surface, the bacteria get stuck. And this is more art than science, I think, this fancy picture, but I think it shows what I mean. Um, and once the bacteria are pointing upwards, they get stuck and they can't spread out. And only well, predominantly the faster bacteria get stuck in these colonies. And the reason is that 
the place where the standing up regions are initiated is a place where two plus a half defects move towards each other. They move towards each other. They tend to move around each other. And that pushes the bacteria to stand up. I've got a movie which sort of shows that, which hopefully explains it a bit more. If the defects move to each other slowly, and that's what would happen in um, defects move towards each other slowly, which would happen for the slow bacteria, they stand up, but they fall down again. If they move to each, towards each other quickly, which would happen in the fast bacteria, they move up, so they're pointing out of the paper, out of the substrate, and they don't fall back down again. So the slow ones might get stuck for a bit, but then they set off again. The fast ones form these rosettes of standing up bacteria and they get stuck and they can't spread out. And so it's the slow ones which spread out. Here it is again. On the left, everything's moving slowly. Things don't stand up. In the middle, you're starting to form the standing up bits. On the right, the bacteria are moving quickly and they're all getting stuck in these um, standing up colonies. I showed you the simulations first because I think they're a bit easier to understand. But Ollie, who's a brilliant graduate student, found this in experiments. Um, they don't look much, but if you think about it, this is a pretty amazing experiment because the you're actually finding this place just here is where those bacteria start forming the rosette start standing up if you can see it work okay so this is one of those things actually being formed and this is after it forms this yellow bit is um, the fast bacteria which have got stuck pointing upwards so they can no longer move along the surface. And so then we tried a mixture to see these things form and we said, let's look at the standing up regions, how many fast bacteria are stuck and how many slow bacteria are there. And you can see that there's definitely more yellow bacteria in the standing up regions, definitely more fast ones. That's my conclusions. This is just one example where topological defects are starting to be important in biology. Since we started this in related work, there are now really quite a large number of papers where people have found topological defects doing things in terms of pushing cells out of layers, um, in terms of initiating the formation of arms on various um, various animals and things. So people are really trying to put together these ideas of active materials and structures and processes in biology. We're a long way away from understanding Drosophila, but we are making a start and it's fun looking at it. So let me finish with this. Good, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to try and unshare my screen. Good. OK, so thank you very much for listening and I'd be delighted to answer questions.
Yes, ma'am. Uh, so we have a lot of questions for you lined up. Uh, the first question which is pending from last time is uh, for the random direction of rotation for the Drosophila egg chamber, could it be related to some sort of nucleation, something that happens in crystal morphologies? Sorry, what morphologies? Crystal morphologies. Crystals. Oh. Um, don't see how, but we don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. certainly um, there's not a million miles away from the sort of nucleation and growth idea in crystals and actually the bacteria stuff I was talking about. These rosettes are formed by nucleation and growth of little yeah. islands of standing up bacteria. Thank you. The next question is, do all the cases fall under nonlinear dynamics or are there any linear patterns or processes which are observed at a micro level? I think most of this is nonlinear, yeah, because I mean you can use linear stability analysis to show that you move away from the stable pneumatic state but not what you get to so yeah the physics here is non-linear yeah the next question is uh, what are the similarities and differences in the theoretical study of active matter and nanotechnology oh good heavens um I mean, there's, this is a Venn diagram, right? Active matter is one side and nanotechnology is the other. And there's a little overlap in the middle because uh, active matter, if you like, is probably a lie. Nanotechnology, which is alive. But we could argue that for hours, I think. Let's go for a nanotechnology that's alive. <laughs> the next question is, um, again, in the same vein. The question goes, in the absence of biochemical signals, uh, it is possible for long term order to arise just due to asymmetries in the environment, a term known as rachetaxis. Can that explain some of these problems? Um, I've never, I've heard of ratchets, but I haven't heard of rachetaxis. Um, I stress that this is really non-equilibrium. Mm -hmm. A long range order and things like crystals, right? Normally is due to things, uh, interactions, yeah, molecular interactions. Yeah. So I think I probably missed the point there, but so uh, the okay. questioner wants to, to, to send in uh, something else. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, being asked by Prasoon Vishwakarma, he asks, when the flock is visualized and then the turbulence motion can be seen, but will the same be also observed when they're watched remotely, like when they're kept in separate petri dishes or like the motions of birds which are far away from each other? So he puts in brackets. I'm trying to think of it like communication in the case of quantum entanglement. Yeah, right. It's not quantum. Don't think quantum, but certainly think uh, in interactions of some sort. You need interactions to see this. It's very much collective behavior. For example, in those bacteria, the vortices are about five or ten bacteria across. There are lots of bacteria interacting with each other. In that case, it's hydrodynamic interactions with the birds. It might be, I don't know what you call them, you know, they might be looking at their neighbor and saying, do you want to fly next to me? So interactions with people which the birds are thinking about. Thank you. The next question is being asked by Aditya Basu. He asks, is it possible to employ a molecular machine to work in the reverse manner? That is, it transduces mechanical energy into other types of energy. That's a very interesting question. And I think we're just so far away from that. I mean, in, in theory, it should be possible, but we can't even do it the right way around. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just trying to think of a biological example. Um, but I can't at the moment, but it's possible there's a biological example which works that way around. Mm. Thank you. The next question is being asked by Nila Red, and they ask, it is a well established notion that the cell signaling has chemical cues as well as mechanical cues at various morphogenetic movements. What do you think about the coordination of both type of signaling or is it possible that either any of the signaling is fair enough to orchestrate the total cellular motion? I mean, it, there's there's a lot of evidence that both are important. Ah. And one of the big questions at the moment is how much is it mechanics and how much is it chemical signaling? And traditionally, sort of historically, um, the biologists thought of everything in terms of Bio, biological signaling, chemical signaling. And now the physicists are mus muscling in and saying, can we, are there any generic principles? Biologists like details, physicists don't. And, and probably the, the right answer is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, putting them together is, is really exciting. Uh, the next question is slightly general, and the question goes, how are physics and biology related and what are the scopes for physics studying students in biology? Um, enormous, I think. I think there's all sorts of places where physicists can look at the living world and this has become a big deal over the past 10 years. Many of the big universities have now opened special uh, institutes for the physics of biology or the physics of cancer or uh, physics of living systems. I think we have to be careful not to explain everything in terms of physics, because obviously that's not the whole story, but it's very much an interdisciplinary subject. And if you want a job as a physics professor, it's probably one of the easier places to uh, to get to get one, um, just because there's so many fan fantastic problems. Mm -hmm. The next question is being, again, is being slightly generalized as in it's extrapolating a lot. The question goes, at a macroscopic level, can one hope to draw a parallel to the formation of galaxies? No, but people talk about topological defects in the early universe and they talk about pneumatic ordering in the early universe, and they talk about phase ordering and phase separation. And so a possible parallel is that the early universe is a non-equilibrium system, just mm -hmm. like these active systems. So, you know, it's, it's a nice coffee table discussion with your cosmology colleagues. Uh, the last question uh, is again around uh, the ratchet, uh, lines of the ratchet axis and ratchets. So the question initially uh, applauds you for an amazing talk highlighting the behavior of molecular motors on the macroscopic scale. And the question is, are the mechanisms which drive these motors, that is information ratchet mechanisms, etc., also studied for these systems? Yeah, definitely biophysicists are worrying about ratchets. Um, and I'm sorry, I just don't know the details of that, but I think there are definitely places where ratchets are relevant. To, um, in a way, the, the, the energy from ATP is getting these motors over energy barriers. So that immediately is a ratchet-like way of thinking of things. That's all the questions we have for you, ma'am. Uh, thank you once again for such an enlightening talk. Thanks, thank you. Okay, so. Right. Um, we done so now. for.
<laughs> First of all, we would like to thank Professor Julia for accepting our invitation and taking the time out for D to give this captivating talk on such an interesting field like active matter. I, I wasn't too aware about it, like I'd heard about it before, and every single slide of your talk was just, it was enthralling. Um, I loved it, so thank you. Um, Second of all, we would like to thank uh, the Dean of the IAS UG program, Professor P.S. Anil Kumar, for making this talk possible. We would like to thank Team Pravega for supporting us in the organization of this talk. And lastly, we would like to thank you, the audience, for attending this talk, and we hope you enjoyed it as well. If you did, um, Pravega is holding a bunch of other talks, which you can check out at pravega.org. And uh, the next one is tomorrow at 11 a.m by Professor B. Anant Narayan, who will be talking about science communication. Um, as for Coherence Lecture Series, we will be back on Monday at 5 p.m. with a talk titled uh, Cosmic Fireworks, Shining Light on Gravitational Wave Sources. It's in collaboration with LIGO India, and it will be delivered by Professor Varun Bhaledao of IIT Bombay. So till then, thank you and take care. <laughs>